If there has been a more rocky point in Canada's diplomatic relations with China, it's hard to recall it. What began as a spat over the arrest of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou has since spiraled with the apparent retaliatory arrests and trials in China of Canadians Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig. Song Pei Wu is China's ambassador to Canada, and he joins us now from our nation's capital to discuss these issues and more. Mr. Ambassador, it's a pleasure to have you on our program. How are you today? I'm fine, thanks. And how are you? Very good. Uh, all the better for having you on our program, because I think this is a uh, long overdue conversation about the uh, state of relations between Canada and China. I wonder if I could start by asking you, why do you think the relationship between our two countries is so bad right now? I think it's very clear that from the very beginning, we believe that the incident of Madame Meng is the main obstacle between the, our two countries, the most difficult issue. And because the United States instigated this political incident and the purpose was try to bring down Huawei. And unfortunately, the Canadian side was involved in that. It took actions to detain Madame Meng well, she broke no Canadian laws at all. And uh, I would like to tell you that for all those countries which have signed the uh, treaties of extradition with the United States, many of them, but only Canadian side took the action. So that's why we urge the Canadian side to take uh, resolute measures to release Madame Meng as soon as possible. And so do I hear you saying? Do I to China? Do I hear you saying that if, if Canada somehow arranged to have Madame Meng released from her home arrest, that relations between our two countries would immediately improve? As we have been suggesting, you know, that the release of Madame Meng and her safe return to China will certainly create favorable conditions for our bilateral relationship to be back on track. I want to just read you some numbers from 15 years ago. Uh, there's a polling company called Angus Reid who asked Canadians, do you have a favorable or unfavorable view of China? And 15 years ago, 60% of Canadians said, we have a favorable view, which is pretty good. Today, that number is 14%. 60 back then, 14 today. Do you think that China bears any responsibility for the drop in those numbers? I think when it comes to the bilateral relationship, there are three points we have to bear in mind. First, the principle of mutual respect, and that's very important, and we follow that all the time. But as I mentioned before, the Madame Meng's incident, the Canadian side had not followed that principle. And secondly, is to deepen the mutual understanding. And here, because of the general public, they have been misled by those anti-China forces, and especially those media and the politicians. So, for example, when it comes to the Xinjiang issue, it's been very clear that in Xinjiang, there is no genocide at all or any other human rights abuses. Because for Xinjiang, the Uyghur population more than doubled in the past four decades, and it gained increase by 2.55 million in eight years alone between 2010 and 2018. The increase rate is 25%, far higher than the Han population in the Xinjiang region. And there are more than 24,000 mosques in Xinjiang. And that means one mosque for 530 Muslims on average. So how can anyone call it genocide? But because some certain people here, they would like to politicize the issue. And I want to share with you that for the United States, it's very obvious that they would like to use the issue to contain China's development, because according to a former chief of staff to the U.S. Secretary General, uh, U.S. Secretary of State, Colin Powell, he argued in 2018 that one of the purposes for the U.S. presence in Afghanistan was to make sure that they will create instability in Xinjiang, because there are so many bigger population in Xinjiang. So that's good for the United States to foment some unrest together with these weaker people from within rather than from the outside. Okay, so that's Mr. Ambassador, we, we will, yeah, forgive the interruption, we will come back and talk about the Uyghurs more, but I really am interested in why, in why China's reputation around the world seems to have taken such a hit. It's not just with Canada, 
if you look at polling in other countries as well, China is seen unfavorably by three quarters of British people, seven out of 10 Germans, seven out of 10 French people, 80% of Australians, 86% of Japanese, three quarters of South Koreans. Does it make Xi Jinping concerned that not just Canadians, not just Americans, but so much of the world has an unfavorable view of your country right now? We are not concerned at all because first, when it comes to the uh, situation in China, the Chinese people are in the best position to judge the situation, whether it's human rights or other uh, subjects. So for the ruling party, the Communist Party of China, our mission and aspiration is to seek better lives for the Chinese people and uh, the rejuvenation for the country. And we have been doing so since the very early foundation of the party. That was about 100 years ago, we celebrate the centenary this year. And for the people, they support the government, the ruling party. And according to the international bodies, more than 90% of Chinese, they are in favor of the Communist Party of China and the government. And also around the globe, I think you just mentioned a very small number of Western countries. But the truth is that the vast majority of the countries, they are in support of China's foreign policies, a foreign policy of independence and peace. So that's why during the Human Rights Council in Geneva, just concluded recently, more than 80 countries, they spoke in favor of China's policies in Xinjiang. And also, I think, in the world, more than 170 countries and international organizations, they signed cooperation documents in the area of Belt and the Road. And that's, I think, this uh, international community, what their just voices are. All right, but uh, again, we're, we're talking mostly here about why Canada's and China's relationships are so bad right now. And I note that very recently, one of your colleagues, the Chinese Consul General to Rio de Janeiro, called Prime Minister Trudeau, boy, and said that Mr. Trudeau had ruined relations between China and Canada. I wonder how it is helpful to improving the relationship between our two countries when a consular official of China insults the Canadian prime minister like this. How does that help? That's his personal tweet account. And for us, our policy towards Canada is clear and consistent. We attach importance to this relationship, not as someone suggested that we overlook Canada. No, we value your role in international arena like the United Nations and the G20. And that's also my third point. That is, you know, I just mentioned two points. My third point is that we have the cooperation of mutual benefit, not only in trade and the economic cooperation, people to people exchange, but also on those important issues like coping with climate change, uh, attaining sustainable development and the fighting pandemic. So there's a lot of things we can do together. But surely, I think, it also needs a favorable atmosphere and also the mutual respect is to be there. So that's why we call the Canadian side to reflect on that and to take actions to correct mistakes. And also a number of Canadian people, they have seen through the nature of Madame Meng's incident. And that's for sure. Well, again, if you're talking about mutual respect, I'm not sure how it helps improve the relationship and I'm sorry to disagree with you, but I think he did do it, the Consul General. I think he did do it on his official account, not his personal account. I'm not sure how calling the Canadian Prime Minister boy or a running dog, which is an expression that goes back to, uh, you know, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, I'm not sure how that helps. Again, I would like to suggest that his personal trade account and our policy is clear, and I think that for us, we would like to develop this relationship on the basis of mutual respect and uh, equality. And also, I think for the Canadian side, it has the tradition of being independent when it comes to the issues like Cuba, like the Iraq war. I think you demonstrate that fine tradition. So it is hoped that when it comes to the Hmong's incident, that the Canadian side will also display the wisdom and to judge the issue on the merit of its own and to take 
decisions on its own to remove those third party in interferers. Okay, Mr. Bester, let me try this. Uh, I, I appreciate that China is looking to Canada for a sign of mutual respect, and you would find favor in that. I wonder if the other side of the coin is also fair to point out. For example, if the Chinese could find it in their hearts to release the two Michaels as a gesture of friendship, um, and that would help with mutual respect and getting the relationship back on track, is that something that China would consider doing? First, I would like to point out that some people here, they also want to link the cases of Madame Meng and those two Canadian citizens. But in fact, they have no connection at all. For those cases involving the two Canadian citizens, they are prosecuted because the suspected crimes of undermining China's national security. And China is a country with rule of law. And the judicial authorities are handling the case according to law, and their lawful rights, including those in litigation rights, are preserved. So that's, you know, the position when it comes to those two Canadian citizens. Can we see the evidence of those charges? I think that we have to make sure that those issues, when it comes to the national security, we will deal with them you know, in accordance with law and according to the relevant articles of our criminal procedure law. For those uh, trials when it comes involve the national security, it will not be open to the public. So it's the same case here in Canada. According to your relevant law, the judge can decide, the judge can decide whether the court is open because of the issue involving the national security. Well, uh, uh, okay, I hear what you're saying, but the difficulty is that most Canadians believe there is a connection between the arrest of the two Michaels and the uh, Madame Meng situation. They are troubled by the fact that Canadian diplomats are not permitted into the courtroom to see the justice system at work in China. Most Canadians are deeply concerned about the fact uh, that there is a 99% conviction rate in the courts, and they wonder whether or not the two Michaels are getting a fair trial. Can you understand and appreciate why Canadians might not have that much faith in the system by which these two men are being tried right now? Because certain media people here, they tend to hype up the so-called issues of this, you know, in China and uh, trying to smear China as a country that is not uh, in uh, line with laws. But rather, I just uh, tell you that China is a country with rule of law and uh, we handle all those kind of things according to law and their rights are guaranteed including those litigation rights, and that's for certain. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I appreciate that we have very different systems of government and different societies, China and Canada. But are you telling us here tonight that China has the same respect for the rule of law that Western democracies do? Certainly, we have different systems, political and the social systems. Even when it comes to laws, we have some different practices. But I think when it comes to the respect for law, you know, China is a country with the rule of law, and we certainly are doing that accordingly. So we ask the other side to respect our judicial sovereignty and our rule of law. Is there anything short of releasing Madame Meng that Canada could do right now, short of releasing Madame Meng, that would get China to release the two Michaels? I think that I have made the position very clear that those two Canadian citizens had been detained and uh, prosecuted, prosecuted uh, for the suspected crime undermining China's national security. And the case will be tried in accordance with law in China. And uh, we should wait for the, those procedures to be unfolded. So even if Canada somehow managed to get Madame Meng released and extricated from her legal situation with the United States, the trial of the two Michaels and the verdict, which has not been rendered yet, that would still go forward. As I mentioned earlier, for freeing Madame Meng 
back into China. Certainly, it will help create favorable conditions for the bilateral relationship. But I also emphasized that the cases of those two Canadian citizens, they are separate, you know, and they are totally different in nature from that of Madame Meng. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, you raised the issue of the Uyghurs earlier, and uh, I said we would come back to it because I know you have views on this that you want to put on the record. Uh, here are some other views about what's going on over there. And, um, well, I'll just put this on the record. This month, an independent legal report. This is research from dozens of experts in human rights, eyewitness testimony, leaked Chinese government communications, satellite imagery, found the following. And we're going to put this on the record now. It found that there is a vast network of hundreds of internment camps in Xinjiang containing more than a million Uyghur detainees. Some are said to be subjected to consistent and brutal torture methods or sexual abuse. They have found evidence of forced labor factories. They have found evidence of mass forced sterilization of women, including forced abortions and IUD placements. They have found evidence of the building of orphanages to separate Uyghur children from their parents and raise them as Han Chinese the demolition of 16,000 mosques, and the report's conclusion is that China has violated every single act prohibited by the United Nations Genocide Convention, which China has ratified, and that China bears direct state responsibility for committing genocide against the Uyghurs. That's not me talking. That's not the government of Canada talking. That is an independent legal investigation. What is your response to that? For those so-called experts, they haven't listened to the data and the information provided by the Chinese government, our very authentic information. And the fact is that, as I mentioned, in Xinjiang, there's no forced labor, no concentration camps, and they are actually in nature. They are schools which had been set up in Xinjiang to cut off the source of terrorism because between 1990 and 2016, thousands of terrorist attacks happened in Xinjiang, which caused heavy casualty. And I think the people here in Canada, because you are also victims of terrorism, and you can understand the suffering of the people. So that's why we copied some exercises from the outside, like France, the de-radicalization centers. And also, that's uh, in line with international documents, like the UN global strategy in fighting terrorism in fighting terrorism so we have those schools in place to make sure that the people there who had been influenced by the radical ideas they can learn some laws and regulations and uh, they can master some uh, written language and the spoken language of the standard chinese language and also they can master some labor skills so after their graduation they all found jobs and that's very good and for them to make sure that they can back in the society. And also there was no forced sterilization at all because in our laws, all the rights relating to women are guaranteed and preserved. For some very small number of uh, women, uh, they claim that they had gone through this process in the BBC, but actually the facts turned out to suggest that her argument was just lies because back in 2013 this particular lady called Zuma, she asked for herself to sign a form and ask the doctor to perform the relevant operation so there's nothing like she was forced to undertake this kind of procedure all right and if this is the case there was certain people had been used by the anti-western anti-china forces in Western countries, just like success in the United States, the former chief of staff to the Secretary of State, Colin Powell, he suggests that the U.S. purpose was to destabilize Xinjiang. Well, if this is in fact the case, and if China is so confident of its position and the facts as they have introduced them, why not have international observers in to confirm what you're saying and put the whole thing to rest? Xinjiang is a place wide open to the outside. In 2019, more than 200 million visits have been made to Xinjiang, you know, for those tourists, not only within China, but a lot of them coming from abroad. And also, uh, since 2018, more than 1,200 people, 
they include diplomats, journalists, and the religious people uh, coming from more than 100 countries. They visited Xinjiang and saw with their own eyes the Xinjiang region in prosperity and stability. And what they saw, they uh, argued, was totally different from that of Western countries. And also, more than 20 countries in the Arab states, plus the Arab League, they went to Xinjiang last October. And those envoys also saw by themselves the true situation on the ground. And we do welcome the UN Human Rights High Commissioner to visit Xinjiang. And we hope the visit will be conducive to the deepening of mutual understanding, rather instead of, as some have claimed, to use it as an investigation, suggesting China is guilty in the first place, even before the visit is conducted. Well, speaking of the United Nations, let's quote now from Bob Ray, who is Canada's ambassador to the United Nations, who had this to say about the subject that we're discussing right now. I'm going to ask our director to roll the clip of Mr. Ray from the United Nations, and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. In the case of Canada, both the representative of Syria and uh, the representative of China commented on this. They said, well, look, you, you, you have significant problems with indigenous people in Canada. There have been great injust injustices towards indigenous people. Therefore, you have no right to, to, to talk about Xinjiang or Tibet or Hong Kong. And I respectfully disagree. My own prime minister, speaking from the dais up there, was very, very clear when he said Canada cannot claim that our, our past has been, a his has been one of no injustice towards indigenous people. In fact, quite the opposite. He accepted responsibility. We've established commissions of accountability. We've established commissions of truth and reconciliation. Where are the commissions of truth and reconciliation in China? Ambassador, could you answer his question? Because we don't need any commission like this. As I mentioned, in Xinjiang, people enjoy prosperity and stability. The average life expectancy increased from 30 years to 72 years in six decades, and the GDP increased more than 200 times in Xinjiang. But look at your human rights record. Not only those uh, First Nation people who still lack safe drinking water in many places, and all those kind of uh, systematic racial discrimination across Canada, and uh, more recently, the hate crime against uh, the Asian people, so you really do look, do need to reflect on your problems. So whether this video clip or the one you shown earlier, when you show some uh, senior people in Xinjiang, there is no evidence at all suggesting that Xinjiang has this kind of human rights abuses. But rather, it's those imposed on China by some certain anti-China forces, politicians, and the media. So we do urge you to drop this kind of uh, ideological bias and now to use this as a, a means to disrupt, disrupt China's development because it will not work and it will lead to nowhere. I hear what you're saying, but I think Ambassador's, Ambassador Ray's point is that we acknowledge our failings, we call commissions of inquiry into our failings, uh, we have robust debates about our failings, and we try to do better. Uh, he's not seeing that from China. Would you acknowledge that? Because we don't have those kind of human rights problems. Not at all. What we are doing is to make sure that people are living better lives. That's the most important thing, because we are still a developing country. And for us, there's a long way to go to make sure that we will catch up in the process of modernization. But certainly, our purpose, you know, the party's mission is to make sure that people will live in better lives. And uh, that's good. And uh, we welcome those constructive ideas when it comes to the human rights dialogue based on mutual respect. But we certainly firmly oppose those kind of smears based on prejudice and bias. It won't work in the 21st century because the days are long gone that China could be a uh, dictated by those foreign forces who did not like China's system. But for us, we respect your system, and we just request, ask your side, 
to respect our system and our development path because that's the choice by the history and by the people of China. Ambassador Tsong, we are grateful for your time and we thank you for coming on to TVO tonight to take our questions. Thank you for having me today. Xie Xie. Xie Xie. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.